to hand the, uh, the meeting over to our, our dear friend uh, Jacob Crash. He's been here to preach once before, and uh, we, we were really, really excited to have him here, and we just started tonight as well. Amen. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you, Lionel. Good evening and greetings in Jesus. Our thanks to the believers here at New Destiny for kindly inviting us back to Frankston. It being the Jewish Sabbath, I'm expo expected a Pope to pray in Hebrew. And if somebody will get angry if I don't, so I'll pray in Hebrew if you'd like me to pray in Hebrew and English because I know we have some Jewish people here tonight. Abino Marcano, Anakim Adibra Hadish, Rokoro Barhocha, Rafa Kiwan, and Mahat, Anna Adonai, Shpor Fuchachecha Aleinu, Ritipat, Ekenam Shalano, Tiferet Shal Barecha. Heavenly Father, pour your spirit upon us this night. Open our eyes to the glory and meaning of your word. Be with us, Lord God, as we ponder these things, and we pray that you give us the wisdom and courage to not only hear us of your word, but do us also in Jesus' name and in Jesus' sake. Amen. Before we turn to Isaiah chapter 36, Let's look at some background passages of tonight's subject. Tonight we'll be looking at the attack on the remnant. The attack on the remnant. In the last days, the Bible tells us will be an apostasy, a great falling away. And I have no doubt, and most of the people I hang out with, like Arnold Kutzenbaum or Dave, Dave Hunt, or Bill Randalls or Philip Powell, most of the people I know who are aware of what's really going on in the world and in the church, in light of prophecy, have no doubt, that we are certainly seeing at least the embryo of the falling away in the last days. Dave Hunt will tell you that, Arnold Fukuma will tell you that, here in Australia, Philip Powell will tell you that, Bill Randalls in America will tell you that. We all pretty well believe that. We're talking now about the attack on the remnant. The attack on the remnant. When you have an enemy who's more clever than you are, who's more powerful than you are, and who's determined to get you, it is crucial that you know as much about your enemy as you can. Even in a war with military intelligence, the more you know about your enemy, the better position you're going to be in the fight. Especially when your enemy knows quite a lot about you. The Bible tells us a great deal about Satan. It tells us much more about Satan than most Christians realize. And unfortunately today, most of what's being taught about Satan or about demons is not biblical. The binding and loosing stuff, and most of that stuff is crazy. It's not scriptural. What does the Word of God tell us about Satan and the way he attacks God's people? The way he attacks the faithful remnant of God's people and the way he will attack them in the last days. In the Bible, when you see the king or emperor of a sinister empire that is inimical to God's people, that is hostile to Israel or hostile to the church, when you see a king or an emperor of an evil empire with a demonic religion, a pagan religion with other gods, they teach something about Satan. They are pictures of Satan, but they also are types of the Antichrist to come. Most of you know from 1 Corinthians 10, Paul tells us Egypt is a figure of the world. Pharaoh was deified by the Egyptians. Now, when you see a man other than Christ deified, it's a picture of the Antichrist, isn't it? But he was the God of Egypt, the God of the world. So in 1 Corinthians 10, as God's people came out of Egypt through the water into the promised land, is a picture of our salvation. We came out of the name of Satan, through baptism into heaven. We came out of the world. Pharaoh is a picture of Satan and a type of the Antichrist. And of course, in the last days, the Antichrist and false prophet will counterfeit the miracles of Jesus and his witnesses, the way that Pharaoh's magicians, Jonas and John Grace, counterfeit the miracles of, of, of Moses and Aaron. One is a picture of the other. Pharaoh is a picture of Satan and a type of the Antichrist. 
but there are others. Turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 14. Verse 4. Then you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. The Babylonian Empire and the power of Babel are pictures of false religion and confederation with the political system of the earth. They typify, foreshadow Babylon the Great in the book of Revelation. Let's look. How the oppressor has ceased in verse 4. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers, which used to strike the peoples in fury with unceasing strokes, which subdued the nations in anger with unrestrained persecution. The whole earth is at rest, it is quiet. They break forth with the shouts of joy. Even the cypress trees rejoice over you, and the cedars of Lebanon declaring, since you were laid low, no tree cutter comes up against us. Notice there will be peace on the earth when the king of Babylon is laid low. This points to the millennial reign of Christ. She all from beneath is excited over you to meet you when you come. That arouses for you the spirits of the dead, all the leaders of the earth. It raises all the kings of the nations from their thrones. They will all respond and say to you, Even you have been made weak as we. You've become like us. Your pomp and the music of your harps has been brought down to Sheol. Maggots are spread out as your bed beneath you, and worms are your covering. Look at verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, sun of the dawn. You've been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Satan wants to be God. Now the idea of the stars here, of course, is the seven of Shemaim, the host of heaven, but Abraham's descendants will be like the stars. That refers, of course, to the faithful remnant of Israel, but also to the true church. He wants to be magnified in God's people. In verse 12, how you've fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. In Hebrew, it is almost identical, almost identical to a messianic title of Jesus, the bright and morning star. Almost identical. And in fact, based on this verse, when you get into the higher degrees of Freemasonry, people who've been saved out of Freemasonry tell us that Freemasonry is Luciferian, and this is one of their verses, that Jesus and the devil are the same. Well, God has two, you know, the sun of the morning, bright morning, uh, bright morning star. God has two sons, Lucifer and Satan, uh, Lucifer and Jesus. It's Lucifer. But as you look, verse 10, that respond to you, you've been made weak as we. When Jesus was on the cross, he was humiliated. They said, come down from that cross. You were so powerful, did all these things. Where is your power now? What happened to Jesus, when, he, when Jesus was judged by our sin, he was mocked as powerless. And so in the judgment of Satan, he's going to be mocked as powerless. You understand? Jesus was judged for our sin, even though he had no sin, so he was mocked as powerless. But the author of sin is going to be mocked in his judgment. Satan wants to be God. The idea of the recesses of the north in verse 13, again, this alludes to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which is a copy of the one in heaven. The king of Babylon is a picture of Satan from that aspect. Going back to the Tower of Babel with Semiramis and Nimrod, the false religious system of the earth, and league with its political system. This is why Peter in his epistle, writing from Rome, says, she who was in Babylon greets you. Those same mystery religions that began in Babylon found their way through Asia Minor. If you come with us to Turkey in next April, we'll bring you to Pergamum, to the city of Pergamum. And from there, they find their way into the Greco-Roman world and into the Roman Catholic Church, etc. But it all goes back to Babylon. So the early Christians called Rome Babylon. She who was in Babylon greets you, Peter writes. And of course, the emperor was worshipped. He was deified. Another picture of the Antichrist. To the Jews, this would have been very important because the Romans destroyed the second temple on the same day of the year as the Babylonians destroyed the first. In the minds of the Jewish Christians of the first century, Rome was simply the new home of Babylon. But let's turn back to Ezekiel, please, chapter 28. Verse 2, the king of Tyre. Because your heart is lifted up, he said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods, in the heart of the seas. You are a man and not God, although you make your heart like God. Again, 
Antichrist. You're wiser than Daniel. There's no secret that's a match for you. By your wisdom and understanding, you've acquired riches for yourself. You've acquired gold and silver for your treasuries. Now again, two of the times the number of the beasts occurs in the Bible, 666, is the tax of Solomon, who have this kind of wisdom and acquire this kind of treasure. Solomon says, to know the words of the wise and their riddles, hetaim in Hebrew, and Daniel tells us the Antichrist will know these hetaim, who know spiritual mysteries, the way Solomon was able to explain it to the Queen of Sheba. Two times 666 occurs with Solomon. When Solomon backslides, he's a major, major type of the Antichrist. And again, it's interesting that both Satanists claim uh, Solomon's authorship for the Black Bible, uh, some of them do, and uh, again, Freemasonry, one of its roots, it claims, is Solomon's quarries in Jerusalem, going back to the temple. That's where they got that measuring thing, uh, the compass. And so they claim. I'm not saying it's true, just that that's what they claim. But you see Antichrist is in the character of Baxter and Solomon. But let's look. By your great wisdom, by your trade, you've increased your riches, and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord, because you've made your heart like the heart of God, Therefore, I will bring strangers upon you, and so forth, and all these judgments will come upon him. Now, again, if you're interested in the Antichrist, you can get our tape series, you can order it, the Antichrist, it's three parts, and I explain how all these people pre-shadow these two coming beasts. But again, we read this. Verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre. All the Hebrew prophets foreshadow Christ in some way. And Ezekiel foreshadows Christ eschatologically in his return. Only Ezekiel and Jesus are called the Son of Man. Okay? Whatever the Bible speaks of the return of Christ, it's never as the Son of God, always as the Son of Man. Okay? And only Ezekiel is called that. Now, again, other tapes explaining this. But we're told in verse 12, you have the seal of perfection. You are filled with wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The ruby, the papyrus, the, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, the emerald, the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets. Now again, the sockets alludes to the ark, doesn't it? You have the sockets on the ark. It was in you on the day you were created. They were prepared. These are the same precious stones you find on the high priest's breastplate and shoulders, but also what you see in the book of Revelation. Satan always tries to counterfeit God. Antichrist tries to counterfeit Christ. That's right. Always. Always. <coughs> right in morning star, star of the morning. Always tries to look like Jesus. Always. Antichrist in Greek does not only mean against, it means in place of. In place of. He always tries to look like Jesus. Always. Now one of the things you'll see so often in the Bible, Jesus had a harbinger, so Satan has a harbinger, one who comes before him. Yochanan HaMakbil, John the Baptist, came in the spirit of Elijah to prepare for the first coming of Christ. So too, somehow the ministry of Elijah comes into play again in the last days before Christ returns. Well, the Antichrist will have his John the Baptist, the false prophet. And as the Lord, you'll frequently see somebody coming before him as his spokesman, pointing people to him. Uh, Another time 666 is used in the Bible, but it only, only makes sense if you read Hebrew, is the weight and dimensions of Solomon's, of uh, Goliath's armor. And his armor bearer goes before him. Frequently in the Bible, when you see types, pictures of the Antichrist, you see somebody going before him. It's always there, the harbinger. Because Jesus has his harbinger, and the Antichrist will have his harbinger, but you've got to look for him. He's always there, and he always means something. And we'll see one of them in just a moment. Satan is a created being, in verse 13. You are the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You are on the holy mountain of God. You walk in the midst of the stones of fire. Now again, we're told in Hebrews that the tabernacle and the ark on earth was a reflection, a shadow, of the one in heaven. Those two cherubs on the ark, Satan was one of them. He was a very powerful angel. So powerful, he thought he could be God. Satan was the most powerful being God has ever created without replicating himself. So powerful, so uniquely powerful, as he can come as an angel of light. And remember, Jesus is the light, John. Satan comes as an angel. 
always the counterfeit. And he thinks he can be God. But he's a created being. You were blameless in your ways in verse 15. Again, from the day you were created. At least states for the second time, Satan is created. And he was created without sin. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground, I put you before kings, and they may see you, etc. Satan wants to be God. The king of Tyre is a picture of Satan. The king of Babylon is a picture of Satan. Pharaoh is a picture of Satan, and they are all types or shadows of the Antichrist. They all reveal something about the Antichrist who is to come in some way. Now again, we have tapes explaining this. But not least of all is the king of Assyria. Moses tells us other gods are demons. Using the Hebrew word Shadim, Paul calls them the mono, like demons. Hare Krishna is not a god, he's a demon. Allah is not the god of the Bible, Allah is a demon. He's very evil god. Demons. That's right. I agree. The first ones to make to use starvation as a military weapon were the ancient Assyrians. Others may have done it, but that was their basic strategy. They popularized it. They defined it. Now, in more modern times, Joseph Stalin used starvation as a military weapon against the Ukrainians, against his own citizens. And uh, Mangitsu in Ethiopia used starvation against his own people. Yeah. But the first ones to do this on a wide scale were the Assyrians. The way they made war was by siege. They didn't begin an invasion by attacking cities or by attacking military installations. They began by attacking the food supply. They would armor plate the wheels of their chariots and attach torches to them and drive them to the grain fields. The first thing they would wipe out is the food supply. They didn't attack any military targets until they attacked the agricultural targets. They starved people into submission and laid siege to their cities. They used starvation as a weapon to get people to bow the knee to them. Now, of course, the Antichrist will ultimately do the same. Right now, Satan will use things like greed and lust to corrupt people. Think when the time comes when he can use survival. Well, that's what he's going to do. Attempt to do, and we'll get away with it. This is the king of the city. A major picture of Satan. Turn with me, please, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 36. The attack on the enemy. The time is just after 585 BC. The Assyrians have got everybody. They conquered all the countries of the Middle East, including the ten northern tribes of Israel. So their thinking was, we got the other ten tribes, what's these other two going to do? Then they come south to Judah. They get Lachish, where a lot of the trouble always began historically, and they come up against Jerusalem. They've got everything but Jerusalem. They've got all the pagan nations in the Middle East. Then they get the ten northern tribes, and then they even begin to get Judah. But they don't have Jerusalem. Now there's a siege <coughs> under King Hezekiah and Isaiah. The people are hemmed in, and he sends his messenger. Again, when you see a type of the Antichrist, you'll see a picture of the harbinger. You'll see his messenger. You'll see the parakeet. <laughs> It comes about, verse 1 of chapter 36, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against the fortified cities of Judah and seized them. Now Isaiah tells us of the king of Assyria, when he was doomed, in his mind he thought it was not so. Although the demons know they're doomed, they said this to Jesus at Gensarim, son of man, if you come to torment us before the time, Satan is so arrogant and so powerful, he somehow imagines he can win. Even though he knows his time is short, he thought he could win. Calvary, of course, gave him a few doubts in the resurrection. <laughs> and the king of Assyria, and then, then he comes against the fortified cities of Judah, and he sees them, always fighting the siege. 
The king of Assyria sent Abshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem. The king Hezekiah with a large army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway of the fuller's field. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shephna the scribe, and Joah the son of the soft, the recorder, came out to him. Then Rebshakeh said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What is this confidence that you have? Notice the real enemy was not Rabshakeh. He was simply the parakeet. He was the stooge. The real enemy is the king of Assyria. The real enemy never reveals himself or shows his hand until it's too late to stop him. The real enemy does not reveal himself or show his hand until it's too late. What you see is the stooge. The real enemy are not the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's the demonic power of Machabin. The real enemy is not the Mormons. It's the demonic power of Machabin. Our enemy is not Roman Catholic people. It's the demonic power of back of the papacy of the Vatican. The real enemy is not the Moss. It's the demonic power on back of Islam. Very briefly, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces, against this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. It's not flesh and blood. It's not the Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on the door. It's not Allahu Akbar. It's not nobody brought the community will spit in the sun. So they are simply the parakeets. They are the stooges. The real enemy is the demonic power of Maccabins. It's not right. a stooge. That's right. He never shows his hand or reveals himself until it's too late to do anything about it. That is the power. That's the power you have to look for. Now, don't worry about that shot. Who is he speaking for? <laughs> Chapter 36 of Isaiah was on telling us. He comes against the leadership. When Satan attacks the remnant, Attack always begins on the leadership. The leaders are always the first target. Satan always begins an attack by attacking the leaders. When Satan wants to get a church, he goes after the pastor, the elders. Get them, we got no problem. When Satan wants to go after a family, a marriage, get the husband and father. Get him? When Satan wants to get a nation, go after the prime minister, go after the president. That's why we're told in Timothy, not only prayer, but prayer and intercession for national leaders. Do I like Mr. Bush? I have more respect for a prostitute on the street corner than I do a president who's owned by oil companies who's in bed with Saudi Arabians who fund terror. No, I don't respect him. But I pray for him every single day. Do I like Mr. Blair? I respect him even less than I do Mr. Bush. But I pray for him every day. I don't know what you think of Mr. Pa of Mr. Howard, but I would urge you to pray for him every single day. Get the leader, get the country. Get the leader, you get the family. Get the leader, get the church. Attack begins with the leadership. And when he attacks the remnant, he goes after the leadership first. When Paul says, let the leaders be tested, remember that does not primarily mean passing your Greek or Hebrew exams at a seminary or Bible college. <laughs> that's good, but it's not good enough. That's important, but it's not what's most important. It's how did that pastor stand up when his marriage was attacked? How did that pastor stand up when he was in financial difficulties? How did that pastor stand up when he was attacked in his health? How did that pastor stand up during times of trial, temptation? How, was, how did he stand up when some woman in the church tried to seduce him? How did he stand up temptation? Let the leaders be tested. Not until the leaders prevail against the enemy and the power of the Lord. Can they possibly qualify as God's agents to guide and encourage others? It just doesn't work that way. Attack always begins on the leadership. 
But let's see what he does. What does he say? Say now, Ramshaka, say to King Hezekiah in verse 4, the great king of Assyria, what's this confidence you have? I say your counsel and strength for war are only empty words. Now on whom do you rely that you rebelled against me? Behold, you rely on the staff of the crushed reed, even on Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go through his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who rely on him in verse 6. Pay attention. In the mentality of the ancient Near East, kings ruled by the strength of their hand. Kings ruled by the power of their hand. If you pierced the hand of a king, it meant that king was powerless. And so when the Lord Jesus went to the cross in my place and in your place, the king of Israel, the king of kings, was powerless. He was powerless. The all-powerful became powerless because he was taking our place on the cross. Okay? If you pierced the hand of and the Hebrew, the words not hand, it's yad, the same way for arm. Forget about that passion film. It was so filled with biblical and historical inaccuracy, you should have been a bug funny cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> they would have went through the radius, not through the metacarpal. The reason that Mel Gibson put the nail through the hand was because he's a Catholic and he was supporting the Roman Catholic uh, superstition of stigmata. We know that it would have went through the radius from um, paleo That's right. Yeah. Yeah. However, He pierced the king's hand with his arm, and he was powerless. So the Lord Jesus was powerless. But look what he's saying. Don't rely on Pharaoh. Turn back two chapters to Isaiah 30. Woe to the rebellious children in verses 1 and 2, who go to Egypt without consulting me to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh. Pharaoh won't be able to help you. Chapter 31, same thing. Who are those who go to Egypt for help? When Satan attacks, what does he do? He quotes scripture out of context. When the attack comes on God's people, the word of God is distorted. Satan quotes scriptures out of context. The Mormon church does it, the Roman church does it, the Mormons do it. Why? Because Satan comes as an angel of light, and so his servants behave the same way. What did Satan do when he tempted Eve? He took something God said out of context. What did Satan do in Matthew chapter 4 when he tempted the Lord Jesus? Took scriptures from Deuteronomy out of context. What did Jesus do? Answer in context. The whole thing was... Between Jesus and Satan was from Deuteronomy. A text out of context and isolation from its co-text is a pretext. When you see people taking scriptures out of context, Bobby Howard Brown is a master of it. Look, the Cold Spring is another one. When you see people taking biblical texts out of context, that is the unmistakable signature of Satan. Coming as an angel of light and his servants behave the same way. They take the word of God out of exegetical context. When the attack comes, that's the first thing you look for. The distorting the scripture. The hold his witnesses, Mormon, doesn't matter who it is. That's his first thing. But that's only preliminary. Look what follows. But if you say in verse 7, we trust in the Lord, is it not he whose high place and whose office Hezekiah has taken away? and has said to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship on this altar. Now therefore, come and make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I'll give you 2,000 horses if you are able, to, on your part, to set riders on them. First, temptation. Horses will only use this, not beasts of burden, but animals of war, either cavalry or full chariots. Military power, that's what Israel didn't have, that's what Israel wanted, that's what Israel needed. We have an enemy who's not only stronger than we are, and more clever than we are, 
He knows us as well as we know ourselves. Satan knows us as well as we know ourselves. He knows our weaknesses as well as our strengths. He knows our good points as well as our bad ones. He knows our vulnerabilities as well as our virtues. He knows the areas where we are susceptible to temptation. He knows the sin that so easily besets. Satan knows us as well as we know ourselves. Now God actually knows us better than we know ourselves. God knows us better than we know ourselves. But Satan knows us as well. So we are up against an enemy who's not only smarter, stronger, but he knows everything about us. Only God knows us better. He knows what we want. He knows what buttons to push. He knows what our old nature likes. He knows what we crave in the old creation. He knows. I'll give you 2,000. It's sort of like the governments in Colombia, South America. The cocaine cartels tried to run the country. And every politician or every judge in Colombia was given two choices. Get rich or get killed. You either take the bribes or we assassinate you. Now, where do you want to die when you can get rich? King of Assyria sent his messenger. Look, we didn't come to hurt you. We came to be your friends. What do you want? Mercedes? No problem. <laughs> he knows what you want. What do you want to make war with us for? We don't want to make war with you. We came to give you something. <laughs> Temptation comes first. He knows what, it doesn't matter what, if it's money, if it's sex, if it's power, he knows what we want. <coughs> when that doesn't work, he shifts gears. What he says. How can you repulse one official of the least of my master's servants and rely on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Verse 9. He can't get you with temptation. He tries to get us with intimidation. And the enemy knows if we take our eyes off the Lord and put it on the problem, we're going to falter. That's right. Oh, I mean. If you take your eyes off the problem and put it on the Lord, you're going to stand. So he's got to try to get us to take our eyes off Jesus and put our eyes on the threat. Absolutely. Intimidation comes second. First temptation, then intimidation. That's his second move. Now God is telling us how he operates because he's smarter than we are. The only advantage we have is the word of God and the Holy Spirit. God shows us how he operates. Forewarned is forearmed. God tells us what he's going to do and how he does it. Because otherwise he'd outsmart us every time. It's only Jesus that makes the difference. He'd win every hand. He can't possibly beat this guy. He'd win every time. It's only Jesus who makes the difference. Yes. Word of God, the Holy Spirit, has the But then he tries the third one. When intimidation doesn't work, what comes next? <coughs> This guy is slick. This guy is good. But before we look at what comes next, look what he's really saying in this context. He says, Why are you rebelling? Who are you to rebel against me, says the king of Assyria in verse 5. Everybody is in rebellion against the king. The question is, which king? Everybody is a rebel. If you are a saved Christian who's truly born again, you are in rebellion against the God of this world. If you are a saved Christian, you are in rebellion against the king of Assyria. If you are not a saved Christian, you are in rebellion against the king of kings. But one way or another, you're in rebellion. Everybody on the face of the earth is a rebel. The question is, for which cause? <coughs> the 
说。For rebels. Now we have to understand verse seven. Hezekiah took away the altars. The Hebrew word for altar is mesobeia. Mesobeia. Mesabeach is the most important picture of the cross of Jesus in Scripture. There are other types of the cross, but the Mesabeach is the most important. It is where blood atonement for sin was made. When the Lord Jesus was on the cross in my place and in yours, and he took our sin to give us his righteousness, he was the high priest making atonement on the altar. He was the Kohen Gadol making korban on the altar. Now there was only one cross, one altar that God accepted. Hezekiah took down all of the other high places. High places were called bimaot, bimaot, high places, bimaot. I've explained this a few times on different dates, but for the sake of the video, I have to explain it on this one. Idolatry does not begin by worshiping other gods. Idolatry begins by worshiping the true God in an unbiblical way. Israel did not begin by worshiping Molech or Baal. They began by worshiping Yahweh at some alien high place. Yeah. Okay. But the Hebrew term for idolatry is very interesting. It's not worshiping an idol. It is Avodah Zerah. Avodah Zerah. It simply means a form of worship that is alien to Scripture. Remember those guys burn strange fire? <coughs> they didn't burn the strange fire to another god. They burned the strange fire to Yahweh. In other words, the term for unbiblical worship and the term for idolatry is the same term. You're already on the same road, you've just gone further down it. Once you begin worshiping the true God in an unbiblical way, you will wind up in idolatry. It was inevitable. The Roman Catholic Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, they didn't begin with the necromancy and the icons overnight. They progressed that way. It comes from Abadah Zerah. You worship the true God in an unbiblical way, something's going to happen. For instance, the Hebrew word for husband, master, and owner is Baal. Baal, husband, owner, master. Baal. Yahweh was Israel's Baal. Your husband is your maker. Much the same as the church is the bride of Christ, Jesus is the bridegroom of the church. Baal. Baal. But the Canaanites had a Baal. Baal Shemaim, the master of heaven. They had another god by the same name. Well, you begin worshiping the true Baal in an unbiblical way, another Baal gets in and counterfeits it. We're from the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter day Saints. <laughs> the biblical Jesus is monogenes in Greek, the only begotten of the Father. The Mormons say that Jesus Christ is the half brother of Satan. Two different Jesus Christs. Two different Jesus Christs. But they claim to be Christian and worshiping Jesus. That's a different Jesus. That's right. Yeah. How many people name, uh, name, Jack, uh, name, name John Jones in the Melbourne telephone book? Just because there's two people named John Jones, I mean they're the same person. A generic 
term or name for God in Arabic. One is Eil, another is Allah. It can be the equivalent of the Hebrew Elohim, but it's also the Arabian moon god. Doesn't mean it's the same god as Christians and Jews. It gets to the point where they get into things which are ludicrous. I have here some Mormon documents. Mormons believe like the Catholics you can save people after they're dead. I have here the baptismal certificate and the celestial wedding certificates of Adolf Hitler and Adolf Brown. They were saved by the Mormons after they were dead. <laughs> Father, otherwise Heidla. Mother, Clara, third wife. Place of birth? Gives it. When he was baptized, when did the Mormons baptize Jesus? Uh, Hitler, in the name of Jesus. 30th of September, 1993, and he was endowed. 27th of April, 1994. Born in Brenau, Austria, he was born again in 1993. <laughs> Made official in 1994. <laughs> and then, of course, him and Eva Braun. He was sealed to his spouse. June 14, 1994. Ava and Adolf are together in heaven. On what planet? Happy, happy lives together forever and ever. That's the Mormons. Now you've got major evangelicals compromising with this. People like Rami Zacharias. You've got the Fuller Cemetery, in a seminary in America. <laughs> Say this could be somehow Christian. Jesus Christ is not the same Jesus. Allah is not the same Elohim. You begin worshiping the true God in the wrong way, you'll get into idolatry. Hezekiah knew this, so he tore down the high places. No, there's only one high place what God ordained to be worshipped. Hearts the only epithets of all that Kiryat Malakarab. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, the city of our God, the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for elevation, high place, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You begin worshiping the true God in an unbiblical way. Mother altar, mother gospel. Today you see it today. This Hillsong stuff and all this pneumocentric worship. Our faith is Christocentric. The Holy Spirit is indeed God. And biblically, as I pointed out a number of times, and I only say this from the tape, he is indeed worshipped as God in the context of the Trinity, like the Charles Wesley hymn from the book of Revelation, holy, 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 God of three persons, no problem, perfectly biblical, in the context of the Trinity of the God. That's right. Once you begin saying, good morning, Holy Spirit, like Betty, well, come, Holy Spirit, let your fire fall, Holy Spirit, we worship you, none of that is biblical. It is strange fire on biblical worship. So you wind up with another Baal, another Jesus, you wind up with another Holy Spirit. The one they have in Toronto, Canada, or Pensacola, Florida. You wind up with another Holy Spirit. That's right. You wind up with an idolatry, you wind up with a counterfeit. Come on. That's what you got. Now Hezekiah realized this, so he tears these altars down. Doesn't work with him. And the temptation doesn't work. The intimidation doesn't work. So now Satan pulls out the ace of his Steve. Look what he does next. Verse 10. Have I now come up without the Lord's approval against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up to this land and destroy it. God's on our side. The Lord's with us. He's not with you. You're not hearing from the Lord. We are. Look how he's blessing us. He's given us all this territory, all these people, all this power, all this wealth. We've got all this. God is on our side. He's not on your side. Yeah, but what, what you're doing is not, not biblical. It's not even moral. Yeah, but look at all the land we've got. What do you mean it's not biblical or moral? We wouldn't have this if we weren't. 
being blessed by God, he's on our side. Third, spiritual seduction. God's with us. Worldly churches will always judge the way the world does because they're of the world. Look how many people come to Hillsong. He wrote a book, You Need More Money. Mammon worship and Christian masquerade. That's right. When I need more money, Jesus gives it to me. If I have a legitimate need, I ask for the right motive. Well, God guides, God provides. Hallelujah. You need more money, now you need more Jesus. Amen. Christian women love sex. What kind of a book is that for a pastor's wife to write? That's right. Preach it. Preach it, brother. <laughs> oh, God's with us. God's with us. Look at all the money we have. Islam is growing in Australia. Cults are growing in Australia. Immorality is growing in Australia. But the big churches are simply taking people from one church and putting them in another church for growth. That's right. Taking money out of one pocket, putting it in another. Are you any better off financially to take money out of one pocket and put it in another? People leave one church for another. Is the body of Christ growing in Australia? No, it isn't. They just come to see the latest freak show in town, that's all. <laughs> when that one is over, they'll go find some other little take asylum and cross on the roof and go to that church. God's on our side. Look at the money, look at the numbers, look at the people. We've got, we got the ten tribes of the north. We got all these other Jews. We got all these other churches. You're the only one in town that won't go into with this Toronto or Pensacola or Hillsong or Purpose Driven or Alpha. You're the only one. God's with us. We got that's the way they think. They think exactly the way the world does. They measure by the same standards and barometers of the fallen world because they love the world. Packers on the now, why is this guy so desperate to get Jerusalem? He's got Damascus! He's got Nineveh! He's got everything! He's got babies! He's got everything! What's he in Jerusalem for? You know, I mean, if you got Melbourne, you got Canberra, you got Sydney, what do you need to want? <laughs> 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 the king of Assyria has everything except what he wants and craves most. Satan has all the false religions of the world. There's all the cults. There's the Krishnas, there's the Mormons, there's all his witnesses. He's got Orthodox Judaism, the seed of the rejection of the Messiah. He has Islam. He has nominal Christianity. He has the World Council of Churches. He has the Church of Rome. He's got all that stuff. He's got everything except what he wants most. Where the true altar is. The one place Satan can't get are the churches that hold to the true gospel, to the true cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. He's got the JWs, he's got the Mormons, he's got the Church of Rome, he's got the Hillsong, but he doesn't have the true gospel. He does not have where the real altar is. You can have a prosperity gospel, you can have a sacraments gospel, you can have a social gospel, you can have any gospel you want. The king of Assyria doesn't mind. It's all his. But if you've got the true gospel, if you got the real author, he's got to get you. That's right. And this is how he does it. Mm. He goes after the leaders. He begins twisting the scriptures out of context. Then comes the temptation. Then the intimidation. Then the seduction. <coughs> God's with us. Look what we got. Look what we have. Well, when it doesn't work. When he can't get to the leaders, what does he do next? <clears throat> Quite simply, he goes for the people. Okay. 
He's a real Democrat. <laughs> Let the people decide. Yeah, brave as Diana of Ephesus. <laughs> Let's go. <coughs> Verse 11. Then Eliakim and Shebna and Joah said to Rabshakeh, Speak now to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. Don't speak with us in the day and in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. No Benachim. Speak to us in Aramaic. Don't speak in a language that people can hear it. The enemy knows our language. In America, because the Roman Catholic Church, every single Roman Catholic diocese, every single one out of 176, they got every one virtually. What protecting pedophile nuns and priests at the expense of not protecting the children whose lives they destroyed? Right. They've all had to pay up through the teeth, and they're still paying. So I have a big damage control operation in America with billboards. Come to Mass, bring your Bible. They know our language. We're saved by grace. Of course, to them, grace is not undeserved favor, as in English. It's not chesed, God's mercy in the covenant, as it is in Hebrew, and it's not charism, a gift, as it is in Greek. To them, it's an ethereal substance earned by the sacraments you get by going to them. <laughs> they know our language, though. The Mormons know our language. They used to be the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now they're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, small print. Yeah. They know our language. The enemy knows our language. I've warned about this a number of times. False religion is generally gets its doctrine in some form of Gnosticism, a subjective mystical revelation. Whenever you deal with Gnostics, and I, again, I apologize to those who know this, I have to say it for the sake of the video. They will always use biblical terms that mean something different by them. Yes, the Catholic and Protestant can agree with saved by grace, but they have two different definitions of grace. Chuck Colson doesn't know what he's talking about. How many of your next Catholics used to be Roman Catholic? Put your hands up, please. Just up high for one moment. See these dear people? You want to know what the Roman Catholic Church is? Do not ask a deceiver like Chuck Colson. Ask somebody saved out of the church. Roman I agree with you. It's the horror of Babylon and Christian masquerade. Yeah, that's right. Saved by grace. <clears throat> <coughs> witness to a new age. I got a wire witness to the new ages. They're running around naked on the beach covered with tattoos. What are educated people? You tell them, I saw the light, they saw the light. You, the light is Jesus, then the light is the cosmic illumination of the inner self. You've got the spirit, they've got the spirit. It's the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. You believe in sin, they believe in sin. That's negative energy. Be negative. They got the can of coke and definition. You tell them you were born again, they were born again. The incarnation. They will use the same terms we use, but mean something different by them. The enemy knows our language. You better understand that, because he understands it. They will say the same things we say, but have a completely different belief system. And naive and undiscerning evangelicals. And their incompetent leaders don't. Sometimes they're corrupt leaders don't. The enemy knows our language. But what else does the enemy know? The people up on the wall watching all this. God bless the faithful shepherds who want to protect the sheep from the wolves. But the fact is, you can only protect the lamb from the wolves. The best way to protect the sheep is to help them to recognize a wolf for themselves. Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice, especially when the wolf comes in sheep's clothing. A pastor can only protect his flock up to a certain point. Parents can only protect their children up to a certain point. My children went off to university. Now they encountered people with Dar who were Darwinists, had a different worldview. They encountered people who were atheists. They encountered people who thought that uh, premarital sex was, was morally acceptable. 
Okay? My son lived in an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood in north, north of London. My son grew up in Israel, but he grew up believing Jesus is the Messiah. Now he's with Orthodox Jews who don't believe that. When your kids go away to university or to the military, or they move away from home, they've got to learn to stand for themselves. They've got to learn to identify the wolf for themselves. You can only protect the sheep up to a certain point. Their motives were right, but you cannot protect people beyond a certain point. You take the lambs, but the sheep have to learn to hear the shepherd's voice for themselves. Look what happens. He says he's going to go to the people. But Reb Shek in verse 12 says, Has my master sent me only to your master and to speak these words and not to the men who sit on the wall? Do to eat their own dung and drink their own urine with you? What they say to your face and what they say about you are two different things. I have read Roman Catholic apologists like Scott Hahn and like uh, Carl Keating. They're quite hostile to born again Christians. It's only in the ecumenical dialogue where they shake hands and they're friendly because they're trying to deceive you. If a crooked salesman comes to your door trying to sell you double glazing and it's a cheap form of plexiglass, is he going to tell you, I am a crook, or is he going to smile at you? <laughs> They're actually quite hostile. We have a paint dealing with this called uh, uh, Numbers, Numbers chapter 25, the zeal of Phineas. Become real friendly. Talk to people saved out of Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses. They'll tell you what that Jehovah's Witness really thinks about you when they knock on your door and all of the watchtower smile at you. Talk to people say that of the Mormons, what they really think about saved Christians. Let them drink their own urine. They're quite hostile, they're quite vulgar, they're quite inimical towards us and what we believe. Then Reb Shepherd stood and cried with a loud voice in Judean. Now he's going to take his case to the demos, to the laity, to the people. And he said, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He'll not be able to deliver you. Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The city will surely not, the Lord will surely deliver us. The city shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. When he can't get to the leaders, he tries to uncouple the people from their leadership. He tries to turn the congregation against the pastor and the elders. When this happens, you know it. If there is a clear moral charge or a clear charge of heresy, false doctrine, against a pastor or an elder, it's one thing. But it's not that when this happens. It's usually something like, I don't believe the pastor is hearing from the Lord. <laughs> I don't think the elders are in step with what God is doing. I think we should be purpose driven instead of Bible driven. Do you? Well, you're entitled to your view. I think we should get these programs. Yeah. Well, here's the purpose driven conference in America, the big one they had in San Diego not long ago. Featured speaker was uh, Rick uh, Warren, the author of Purpose Driven Church, Purpose Driven Life. Just read you the agenda. 7.30 to 10.30, the labyrinth was open. It's Roman Catholic medieval mysticism, meditation in the Latin labyrinth. 8.30 to 9.15, prayer exercises. This was popularized in evangelical circles by Joyce Huggins. It comes from the uh, Exercises of Ignatius Loyola, the Dome of the Jesuits. Visualization. Then after that, 9, uh, 8, 8 30 to 9 15, yoga. <laughs> yoga. Right after yoga, 9 30 to 11 30, featured speaker Rick Warren. After that comes creative, multi sensory worship. <laughs> <laughs> Then on ramp to postmodernism, the paradigm shift. Then prophetic imagination, condemned as clairvoyance in the scriptures. That's right. 
followed by a 4 p.m. to 5.45 comedy. <laughs> yes, I mean, the whole thing is comedy. <laughs> followed by a comedy night. With Jeff Alton. And then, La Pieza Resistance, 9.30 p.m. The Emerging Pub with live music. If I wanted to go to a pub with live music, I know a great one on Temple Bar in Dublin. <laughs> now, it so happens I don't want to go to a pub with live music, but if I did, which I don't, but if I did, that's where I would go. I don't come to church to go to a pub with live music. I don't go to a pastor's conference for a pub with live music. <laughs> and if I wanted to practice yoga, I would become a Hindu. <laughs> Purpose driven? Yeah, go ahead. Have your purpose driven. They tried to uncouple the leadership from the people and the people from the leadership. They tried to sow rebellion in the camp. Don't listen to the pastor! Don't read books by Dave Hunt, don't listen to that video by Bill Randalls, keep away from Philip Powell, don't listen to those guys that Jacob wants his face, keep away. <laughs> don't listen to Hezekiah in verse 16, thus says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me. Come out to me and eat each of his vine and each of his fig tree and drink each of the water of his own sister. I want to give you something, what do you want? Until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain, new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Don't you want all this? Beware lest Hezekiah misleads you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered him from the hands of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of these other nations? Read it for yourself. Temptation. <coughs> Intimidation. <coughs> Seduction. God's not going to help you. He's with us. Nobody else could stand against the king of Assyria. What do you think you can? What do you want? A land like your own? Vines? Big trees? We'll give them to you. No problem. If the leaders can't see through that, the people don't have a chance. The question is, how do we respond? This is how it happens. This is how the attack comes on faithful churches. This is what he does. The Lord told us, and this is what this guy's going to do. This is just how he's going to do it. But how do we respond? Verse 21, but they were silent and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was, do not answer him. Never, ever, ever, ever negotiate with the devil. When the temptation comes, the voice we listen to is going to win the fight every time. When intimidation comes, when spiritual seduction comes, God says, do not answer. There's a high partisan money preacher in America named Ron Costley. I saw him on TV several months ago. And he was standing on TV shaking chains with padlocks on them, saying, come down from there, Satan will bind you in the name of Jesus. I wish God let Satan show up just that one time. <laughs> <laughs> Turn with me, please, to the epistle of Jude, verse 9. But Michael the archangel, powerful angel now, when he disputed with the devil about the corpse of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. 
an archangel, a powerful angel. Now we're told how powerful Michael is in Daniel's epistle, uh, Daniel's letter, book of Daniel. Powerful angel. He wouldn't dare to mess with the devil. This is the most powerful of the angels. Is Satan a defeated enemy? Yes. Is he a destroyed enemy? No. The Lord will destroy him with the breath of his coming. I go to Africa all the time. Because we have orphanages there for AIDS babies and stuff in our ministry. That's our main mission field with the HIV children in Africa. And I have to go there all the time. You have the big five. The rhinoceros, the hippo, the elephant, the African buffalo, and the lion. When you see these animals in their natural habitat, it's completely different than seeing them in a zoo or a safari park. They're powerful. You don't mess with, they don't even mess with each other between species. The Africans will tell you, when is a lion most dangerous? After it has been mortally wounded. Now he's on his way out, and he's determined to take anybody or anything with him that he possibly can. Get others away from him, he's dangerous. Satan goes around, Peter says, like a roaring lion, seeing whom he can devour. This guy is powerful. Is he defeated? Yes. Can he win? No. Is he finished off yet? Is he destroyed? No. Who finishes him off? Well, according to Kevin Connor here in Melbourne, the triumphant church. Yeah. Uh, I read his book on the church, at least I tried to. Uh, I have put it down, it was too silly. He says, we know that the church is going to be triumphant over Satan because what it says in Genesis, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he will bruise you in the head. Read it. First of all, in the context, the woman is Israel as much or before it's the church. Secondly, it doesn't say the woman is going to destroy this question of heads, it's the seed of the woman. Not being able to read Greek or Hebrew is one thing. But when you can't read English, you can be in the <laughs> Hell have I said so? It's a fair question. Glenn <coughs> Waverly. Romans chapter 16, the Lord of glory will trap us in our feet. He will destroy him with the breath of his coming. No, he's not coming for a triumphant church. He's coming with the triumphant church. That's been resurrection and rapture not again. Look what happens in Isaiah. Turn to chapter 37. <clears throat> Verse 36. The angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the men arose early in the morning, behold, all that were dead. So Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, departed, went home, and went back to The angel of the Lord is the Metatron in Judaism. Definite article in Hebrew, Hamalak Adonai, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is that angel with whom Jacob wrestled and saw the face of God. The angel of the Lord is a Christophany, an Old Testament manifestation of Jesus. Jesus destroys Satan. Amen. The offensive aspect of the war was to rescue others from him, not to kill them. That's God's job. He's a defeated enemy. You don't have to kill somebody who's already mortally wounded. They're going to die anyway. <coughs> you just have to get others away from them. Let's look. The first response when the attack comes, the command of the king, it says, the command of the king is, do not answer. When the temptation comes, when the intimidation comes, when the seduction comes, what was the Mike, Michael's response? That should be our response. Lord rebuke you. Talk to the boss. Don't talk to me. Talk to the boss. You know the boss. The guy you thought you defeated on the cross, but he rose from the dead and defeated you. Yeah, the one who mortally wounded you, that boss. Go talk to him. See what he tells you. That is the only response to temptation, to intimidation. It's a spiritual seduction. Talk to the boss. Because if you let him talk to you, you're finished. If I let him talk to me, you're finished. 
Oh, go ahead. I know you used to be a gambler, but one bet's not going to hurt. Oh, you used to be an alcoholic, but one drink it was music. As soon as you begin negotiating, you can That's right. <laughs> you had it. You know, when I was a kid, I was addicted to cocaine. When I was in university, I was addicted to cocaine. You know, a long time ago. I think it would only take one joint, one spliff, to put me back on the road to what I used to be. That's all it would take. Now, it's all these years, like 25 or whatever it is, I don't even can count as one. A long time. That's all it would take. You might be gambling, might be liquor, might be something else, I don't know, something sexual, I don't know. But he knows. <laughs> you can bet he knows. You can show up there. I know what it is for me. I don't know what it is for you. I know what it is for me. But whatever it is for you, you can bet he knows. Watch the second response. And now the king, the son of Hilkiah, was over the household, and sheep of the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, to be quartered king to Hezekiah, with their clothes torn, and told him the words of Rebshekah. And when king Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and entered the house of the Lord. What does renting one's garments and covering oneself with sackcloth or sackcloth and ashes mean? What is that in the Bible? What is it? What you, yeah, but... Repentance. When it's, when it's the sackcloth, renting the garments could be mourning. You're right. Sackcloth. One of the reasons God allows opposition to come against us, one of the reasons God allows Satan to attack us and our families, our marriages, our church, because it keeps us in the repentance mode. It uses the enemy <coughs> to keep us going back to the cross. When you or I are in a jam, when we're in real trouble, when we really need God to intervene and do something, when we're really in over our heads, when we really need God to do something, doesn't matter what it is, but you're in a real jam, you're in a trouble, you've got a problem, and you need the Lord to intervene, and you go to ask the Lord to intervene, what's the first thing we become aware of? Our own sinfulness. <clears throat> Why should you answer my prayer when I did this, 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 and I failed to do that, that, and that? Yeah. Fortunately, we have a God who is faithful and we are unfaithful. No, Fortunately, he's a loving father whose fidelity does not depend on our infidelity. Absolutely. But he corrects his children and he will use opposition to keep us repenting and dealing with the old creation. <clears throat> the old nature makes opposition necessary. Now a time will come when Jesus comes back, that won't happen. You understand? He'll be, he'll be bound. During the millennium, he'll be thrown into the... the the lake of fire. It won't always be this way. But for the time being, until Jesus comes back, that's it. We have two natures. And he knows how to pray on the old. No, God is faithful and we are unfaithful. However, he will still use opposition to deal with our unfaithfulness. You notice why faithful Christians often tend to have more problems than unfaithful ones? Why saved people have more problems than unsaved ones? God only corrects his children. He doesn't correct them. Who's going to correct somebody else's kids? They're not responsible. They're not responsible. Oh, my kids. Oh, there's a devil. They'll give them anything they want. They'll give them anything they want. As long as it takes them to the road. As long as they stay on the road to hell, they'll give whatever they want to keep them on. What comes next? They go before Hezekiah. Hezekiah says, we have to ask Isaiah, and Isaiah says in verse 6, don't be afraid of him. We respect his power, but we don't fear a defeated enemy. If he's mortally wounded and he can't win, all you've got to do is keep away from him and rescue others from him. Amen. 
ล้วผมแอสเซทต้องไปแอสเซทที่อื่นแอสเซทเฮสเซคายาบรีนส์ฮิสเลตเตอร์ในบทที่14และพูดถึงพระเจ้าและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูดและพูด
We have buffoons in pulpits teaching Aaron not knowing that. You know, so you talk to people from Phil Pringle's church, from Brian Houston's church, you'll be amazed at how biblically ignorant those people are. You'll be amazed. They don't have a fundamental knowledge of the Word of God. They don't know the basics. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, truth actually comes before righteousness. Why? Because if you don't know what the truth is, you won't know what righteous conduct is. Without charismatic Catholics praying in tongues to Mary, committing the sin of necromancy and idolatry, thinking that it's Christianity. By the way, my own family is a mixture of Roman Catholic and Jewish. I love Catholics, I love Jews, I love my family. But because I love my family, I want them to know the truth. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, and the Church of Rome is not the Church of Jesus. That's right. I love Catholics and Jews. That's why I want them to know the truth. Let's look. Then shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's in Isaiah 52. I love you on the map from the feet of it, which is good news. Notice, not until you have right doctrine, right heart, you put on the shoes of the gospel. The defensive armament is put on before the offensive. Unless you can resist him yourself, you cannot rescue others from him. And an effect is not. So when it doesn't work, what does Rav Shaka do? He rants and raves. And he just repeats the same nonsense. Yeah, you're like a broken record. We've heard it already. So what does the king of Assyria do? He rants and raves and just repeats the same nonsense. <coughs> what did the people do when they listened to Hezekiah and Isaiah? Resist, resist. Stand firm, stand firm, stand firm. What does the king of Assyria do? He runs away back to Nineveh. Resist, resist. Stand firm, stand firm, stand firm. Do not answer. Get your own relationship with the Lord, right? Stand firm, stand firm, stand firm, that we may be able to resist. What does it say in the Epistle of James? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. God bless. Pastor? Oh.